Hi, everybody, and welcome to Neuroscientist Talk Shop. Today is Thursday, March 9th, 2023, and we're talking with Lauren Dobbs, who's assistant professor. I get that right. I just yep. didn't say your name wrong. Yep, yep, you're right. I'm yep. so afraid I will do that. Soon. You got me. <laughs> who's assistant professor of neuroscience and neurology at the University of Texas at Austin, just yep. a short distance away. And Lauren studies the neural substrates driving drug use and addiction, especially the behavioral and circuit interactions between the effects of various drugs or abuse. And, uh, for example, the ways that the effects of cocaine may interact with those of opiates. Correct. Yes. And uh, she's a neurophysiologist, a pharmacologist, a behavioral neuroscientist. She combines all of those things in her work. <laughs> many, many tricks. <laughs> so welcome, Lauren. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This is great. Also with us is Matt Wannett, UTSA neuroscientist and expert on neural systems and motivation and podcast regular. Hi, Matt. Howdy. And me, I'm your host, Charlie Wilson. So, Lauren, one reason for thinking that dopamine modifying drugs like cocaine or amphetamine might interact with opiates and their effects in the brain is that they intersect in the striatum and that uh, there's this beautiful and very categorical relationship between opiate expression, dopamine receptor distribution and anatomical connections of the cell types in the striatum that are partly engaged in the motivational. I mean, I don't want to say anything too strong, but I think of it as a kind of very important part of the brain for motivation, right. motivated behavior. And, uh, Amen. So, <laughs> so um, Maybe you could start by giving us just a little reminder of what those anatomical relationships are and uh, what sure. kind of a clue you think that is for how we should proceed to understand motivation and drugs. Sure. Well, I, I think the way you described it as beautiful is is very apt. <laughs> I think that's correct. I think it, these neurons are beautiful and, and the anatomy of the striatum is really, really beautiful and how they are categorically separated. So within the striatum, um, the majority of the neurons are these GABAergic neurons that have these beautiful dendritic um, arbors and spines. Um, and they can be categorized roughly into two different groups. So you have um, some medium spiny, they're called these medium spiny neurons. And some of these neurons, half of them, um, you can divide them up by their expression of a dopamine receptor. So one half express the dopamine D1 receptor, which is a GS coupled receptor. Um, so when dopamine binds to that receptor, you'll get, you know, kind of activation of this neuron and en enhancement in neurotransmission. Um, these neurons also express uh, certain neuropeptides. So they express substance P. They also express uh, an opioid neuropeptide called dynorphin. Um, and then the other half of the medium spiny neurons uh, express a different type of dopamine receptor. They express the dopamine D2 receptor. And this is a GI coupled receptor. So when dopamine binds to this receptor, it's going to you know, suppress the activity of this, this neuron, suppress neurotransmission. And these neurons, they express a different you know, peptide milieu. They actually express a different opioid peptide called enkephalin. And enkephalin and dynorphin, they're these two, while, while they're both opioid peptides, they actually uh, work on different, well, they have the highest affinity for different opioid receptors. And these opioid receptors are also expressed quite ubiquitously <laughs> throughout the striatum. So when we think about kind of the intersection of cocaine and you know, perhaps opiates and opiate drugs or the opioid system, it's almost kind of a no-brainer that you would think of the striatum as kind of this hub that integrates information coming from you know the opioids and, and cocaine because cocaine as we know will increase dopamine transmission in the striatum that enhanced dopamine transmission is going to act on these postsynaptic dopamine receptors either the d1s or the d2s and then these neurons that express those dopamine receptors also have these peptides and these peptides can be released um, through long-range projections out of the striatum, but also within the striatum themselves, where they can modulate um, synaptic transmission of GABA within the striatum. So there's a very beautiful and probably com very complex <laughs> relationship between um, cocaine-related dopamine transmission and how it might affect opioids. And so how these two things interact and synergize to I think you're right to think of it as motivated behavior to affect 
the activity and the output of the striatum to affect motivated behavior is a fascinating question that um, our lab is trying to parse out. So one thing about it is there seem to be these oppositions, like D1 and D2 receptors sort of do opposite things. I know it's complicated and I'm oversimplifying, but they seem to do kind of opposite things. And then the two kinds of spiny projection neurons also inhibit each other. Correct. And so in some sense, they are in opposition. They have opposite effects on behavior, uh, roughly mm -hmm. uh, opposite effects on behavior. And then, uh, so do the two opiates, dynorphin and enkephalin, also have opposite effects? Right. That's, that's a good point that you bring up, right? So we do, we do know that roughly these two populations of medium spinies, they have, are associated with more or less kind of opposite motivational forces or valences, if you will. And the opioid peptides themselves, so dynorphin has canonically been related to more of an aversive signal and um, you know, mediating kind of active and you know, kind of negative motivational states, whereas in Kefalin, um, more associated with kind of, you know, pro-motivational states, especially um, a lot of research recently has come out with um, social motivation. Um, so they are, they do kind of also share that same sort of dichotomy. So that's funny. The Kefalin neurons are slow down or stop neurons in some way. I, 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 I would normally chastise myself for things like this. I don't want to say but, that in front of you. So. <laughs> but uh, but uh, but enkephalin is a some sense a speed up thing, right? And so it it gets complicated because if if you think of enkephalin signaling, so enkephalin can bind to opioid receptors uh, like the mu opioid receptor and the delta opioid receptor and. Activation of these opioid receptors, especially in the ventral portion of the striatum, um, has been associated with kind of you know, pro-hedonic aspects of reward. Um, and it gets complicated, though, because these receptors that it binds to and that are associated with this pro-hedonic motivation are expressed on both the D2 MSNs as well as the D1 MSNs, and they're also expressed on terminals coming into the striatum. And so really our understanding of, you know, how and when enkephalin is activating different populations of these receptors to, you know, affect, you know, the activity of different neurons and the overall output of the striatum is really so vastly um, poorly understood, I think. This is a huge gap for us, and I know that we've known about this for a long time. Those peptides were discovered decades ago yes. <laughs> and described in those neurons decades ago. And it just seems that things haven't moved very rapidly. What's the, what's the hang up? Is it technically, well, <laughs> is there a special technical difficulty? I, I don't know. Well, I think it's multiple things. And, you know, I have my own opinion. Well, so when I started proposing looking at the intersection of opiate drugs and, and cocaine and the striatum, um, um, you know, there was some pushback that, oh, well, the, you know, opiates really have nothing to do with cocaine and they have nothing to do with, you know, stimulant reward or, or whatever. And I think the canonical view, too, of how opiates, like synthetic opiates, like heroin, for instance, are rewarding is this canonical view of disinhibition of dopamine neurons. So going back to the midbrain where the dopamine neurons um, originate. But when you look at the striatum, I mean, it is just filled with opioid peptides and filled with opioid receptors. So to think that it doesn't play a role at all, I think is um, a misjudgment. <laughs> uh, so I think that is part of, may, maybe part of the reason why it has been less studied. I think maybe it's been understudied because I think so much of the focus has been on the midbrain where the dopamine neurons are. Um, and then I think the other part of that is because it is so complex. So understanding which cell types and which compartments these opioid receptors are expressed on and when, <clears throat> at, you know, at what times are certain populations of these receptors recruited over others. I think it gets immensely complex. Um, and we might not really have the tools to be able to parse out well, let's just look at mu receptors, for instance, in this one cell or this other cell. So I think that gets a little hard. Uh, but you talked about some interesting strategies that at least are emerging as far as being able to look at uh, you know, neuropeptide release in right. vivo. And then also some cool 
ideas about how you might be able to sort of parse out signaling that might be happening locally within the the striatum versus, you know, the signaling that happens outside of the striatum. And I guess is that sort of maybe talk a little bit about that if you could, and sure. you know how that might be able to help out uh, parse out. The complexity the complexities of... <laughs> of it all. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think you're right. So the tools are coming along, and I think in part we have a lot of tools coming with these fluorescent sensors. And so a lot of times these sensors, they're uh, they're mutated receptors. So if you have an, a mu opioid receptor, you can you know mutate it, package it in an AAV, and attach a, a fluorescent sensor to it. So it releases its fluorescence, right? And you can see whenever an endogenous ligand binds to it. Um, so in that way, you're able to actually see in real time when, you know, these peptides are actually being released and under what circumstances they're being released and, you know, when they're actually having their effect. I say have you the, done that? So we, we have, um, we're, we're starting a collaboration with uh, Dr. Michael Brukus and his lab and he has, he, you know, he's developing some of these sensors and we're testing them out because we have a novel encephalin knockout mouse. So we have a mouse that lacks encephalin specifically from those D2 expressing medium spiny neurons. And so we're hopefully going to try to validate this. But there's an added complexity there because with the mu receptor, it's not only activated by encephalin, it's also activated by a different opioid peptide called beta endorphin, which I didn't mention. Um, because it's not uh, it's not expressed by the cells in the striatum, but there are terminals that come into the striatum that release beta endorphin. So even then, we can have a sensor, but is it really due to encephalin or is it due to a different peptide that's still... A I really think that's part of what's missing. Right. So the fact that there have been um, electrochemical ways of detecting dopamine on a pretty fast time scale mm -hmm. has been super important for understanding dopamine. I think that's one of the reasons we know a lot about dopamine dynamics is we have had tools for doing that. But it, one of the first things that people say when you start asking them about peptide cotransmitters is, well, we don't really even know when they get released or what it takes mm -hmm. to release them. And why not? Right? Because we can't detect when they are released. Exactly. And yeah. so the, just having a sensor like that to tell you, at what first, just what's the time scale? Is it always really slow? Or are there right. fast things and slow things? Is, is it happening all the time? Or is it only happening under certain special circumstances? Does it happen at the same time with the fast neurotransmitters? Yeah. How is it regulating that? Right. Yeah, these are all fantastic questions. So one thing that... I'm going back to times when listening to Charlie Chuck and talk about sort of, um, and I think Jennifer Whistler as well, um, talking about receptor internalization. And I guess mm -hmm. how, you know, as far as the opioid receptor internalization, and I guess how does that potentially factor into another added level of complexity here? And I guess under sort of normal circumstances, is it thought that there's sort of a lot of sort of natural internalization of the receptors with, you know, everything's being okay, but then you bring opiates on board that sort of then can trigger further cascades. I guess I, I, I sort of always thought of like the, the opiate system as a little bit more dynamic in a way of the, the receptors. Um, again, and over, if we're going overly simplistic on things, but I, I, that's at least what I've always thought about that. And I guess it, is anything that you've sort of seen in your research sort of speak to that or, or just largely as a whole, as a, you know, as the field, what's sort of known about the internalization of the receptors in sort of the striatum and yeah. Yeah. This this is where I think I'm going to reach a lot of my limit of, <laughs> of my 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 knowledge here. But yeah. So opioid receptors they are known to desensitize and they are known to have internalization and you know they have specific mechanisms that mediate these things. And the endogenous um, opioid peptides like enkephalin are really good at, at doing this. Um, I think you know, John Williams has shown this a lot. And you know whether or not. You know how how this is actually happening in I guess in vivo in an intact system. Like, is this happening again? Like, we can look at. I think most of the work with this has been done with like synthetic opiates, right? And oh, we can see internalization. And there's been a big interest in this, especially with fentanyl lately, right? So, um, is fentanyl causing the same sort of internalization? And if so, is it still signaling once they've been internalized? You know, possibly so. Maybe that's why it's so deadly. Um, but as far as in an endogenous intact system, how and when, I think it gets back to the same question, right? How and when these endogenous peptides are being released, we still don't know. And so how do we know, 
when the receptors are also getting internalized. I guess it brings another question to mind too, when we think about making these sensors um, that are artificially expressed in the system, you know, are they going to have the same sort of internalization kinetics and, um, you know, are they bound to the same like, you know, beta arrestin pathways and things that, that mediate some of these events? And are they going, or is that a true readout of what the normal natural physiological receptors are doing? I don't know. That's, but that's something I think we need to consider when, you know, we're <laughs> using these sensors. Yeah, for sure. So one of the things that we do know about the interaction between the opiates and um, dopamine, uh, uh, not so much dopamine, but this spine neurons that respond to dopamine, is that in, that the peptides alter the communication between the spiny neurons. So that's, that's a clue, mm -hmm. and maybe you could bring us up to date on that. Okay. Yeah. So at least in, you know, in our hands with our work, what we can show, right, with these medium spiny neurons, they, you know, provide the major projections out of the striatum, but they also have very extensive projections onto one another. And they synapse onto one another. They're all, they're releasing GABA onto one another. So this is that idea of local lateral inhibition. So there's, uh, they're, you know, inhibiting their neighbors. And this inhibition can be regulated by G protein receptors. So, for instance, the D2 receptor, it's a G protein coupled receptor, it's GI coupled. You know, you can inhibit GABA transmission if you put a D2 agonist on. And so you can affect your, your neighbor, you can affect the neighboring pathway, maybe the, you know, the, the pro motivation, the, the go pathway, if we dare say that here, um, by, you know, through a disinhibition mechanism. And what we found recently in our work is that opioids do the same thing. So you can have an increase of enkephalin uh, within the slice, either by bath application or by potentially artificially enhancing the levels um, by preventing the breakdown of these opioid peptides. And they're acting via these presynaptic and potentially also postsynaptic receptors to inhibit this GABA transmission onto these D1 receptor MSNs. So again, we think that this is another mechanism um, where how we think the synergy might be happening is that these endogenous opioids can disinhibit, right, these D1 MSNs. So it kind of disinhibits this, you know, what is canonically th thought of as this, you know, more pro-motivational, pro-motor pathway. Um, so that this is one circuit mechanism that we're hypothesizing might be at play uh, when we think of how opiates might actually synergize with cocaine uh, and even synthetic opiates. So when you think about why do people take more than one drug at a time, um, well, there has to be some added benefit. Most people, by the way, don't just take one drug at a time you know, or, or one drug at all. Maybe they alternate, you know, the patterns of, of intake, you know, this is also a Another question, um, how people abuse, co-abuse drugs is also vastly understudied. But one reason, right, why these two drugs might be synergistic, at least from a circuit mechanism we're hypothesizing, is through the, the disinhibition possibly of this you know, D1 MSN pathway. But you really had some really elegant data that sort of spoke to how Cocaine exposure can actually influence, you know, uh, in, in caffeines and, and um, expression. And I guess, you know, how, could you at least talk a little bit about that and how there is sort of a direct connection? It isn't just they happen to be in the same brain region. You right. manipulate sort of one one portion of this, and you get sort of a, a corresponding change over here, and and vice versa. Right. And so, you know, this it's really interesting. It's not just a correlation, as you say, and. Um, this is this has been shown in, in other labs before us, I, I, I must say. So if you have rodents with a history of cocaine exposure, whether it's passive exposure where the experimenter delivers the cocaine, or whether you've trained the rodent to self-administer cocaine over you know, a period of time, um, you will see an increase of in keflin uh, at the message level, so the mRNA within the striatum. And you know, that, that had been shown, and so we replicated that in, in our lab. And what wasn't clear, so something else that had also been shown is that the 
level of activation of D2 receptors uh, or dopamine transmission in general within the striatum, if you alter that, you can also uh, get an increase of enkephalin. So if you kind of downregulate dopamine transmission, and they thought it was through D2 receptors, but it wasn't clear yet, um, you could also get this increase of enkephalin. So we had hypothesized that, well, could cocaine... Um, be down-regulating D2 receptors. So if you have a long-term exposure to cocaine, it had been shown that you can down-regulate D2 receptors. And might this be a mechanism for why we're seeing this enhancement of enkephalin? And that's exactly what we see. And there seems to be some evidence. Again, we're at the limits of our tools. We can't really measure the release of the peptide, but um, we can make some inferences based on our electrophysiology recordings that this has to do, it's actually um, raising the tone of an opioid peptide, potentially in kephalin within the striatum. So there does seem to be this, this link. It's not just that it's a coincidence that, you know, opioids and, and dopamine seem to be, you know, uh, interacting at, at, at this level of the anatomy. Um, but it's because they're interacting at this level of anatomy that they're in this key position to where they can influence each other, um, which I think is just endlessly fascinating. It is true that people might take both of those drugs and that they're both drugs of abuse and mm -hmm. they're in the same structure, but the experience of taking, I mean, I'm speaking for a friend, but the experience of taking these drugs is not similar. One right. of them is a stimulant, one of them is a depressant. Mm -hmm. um, they're both acting on this motivational circuit. Does that make any sense uh, that the, from what we know about the anatomy and the connectivity that they would uh, that they would have such opposite effects on motivation in general. Right. I mean, I think I get back to. I think you have to kind of go back to the epidemiological reports, which again are are pretty poor when it comes to understanding how people co abuse drugs. It's actually shocking how little is reported. Um, but there is some information out there about the behavioral motivation. So if we start there, we can understand why are people taking these, you know, types of drugs together. And sometimes, you know, it, it's for a variety of different reasons, but sometimes what they, they do report is, you know, kind of mitigation of the effects of the other drug. So if you get, you know, too on edge with cocaine, you can take an opiate to try to balance that out. If you start having withdrawal from opiates, you can take cocaine to maybe balance this out. And when we think about it that way, you know, some of the hypotheses our lab is, is planning on testing first is to really understand from that behavioral motivation perspective, could this be um, one of the reasons why, why they're taking these drugs? And then I think to link it to the circuit, um, so for instance, if we're thinking that cocaine might alleviate some of the aversive aspects of opiate withdrawal. Well, we know that cocaine can enhance enkephalin levels, which is an opioid peptide. So perhaps maybe these heightened in opioid peptide levels are somehow substituting and mitigating some of the you know, effects when you go into withdrawal from, from opiates. And so that's something we can test. We can test that you know, pretty easily in, in our behavioral models and, and then take that into the slice work too. Um, and we can test, you know, using selective knockouts of different opioid receptors from different cell types and different, and from our enkephalin uh, cell type selective knockout. Well, is it really enkephalin? Is it really this receptor on this cell? Where is it happening in the circuit? We can measure things like GABAergic plasticity in between, you know, the D2 MSNs and the D1 MSNs and see how that changes with exposures to drugs, um, you know, one drug versus versus two drugs and start trying to link these pieces together to see, you know, behaviorally, you know, is this how it's working? And circuit-wise, is this how it's working? So if we think of the, the, the D1 dynorphin cells as pro-motivational and the D2, I mean, right. just, take, just let's say that, mm -hmm. uh, and the D2 are the opposite of that, then we should be expecting that cocaine would make, would shift the balance in favor of D1, and that opiates should shift the balance in favor of D2 because opiates make you do less. I mean, I'm sure a mouse in an open field will run around a lot less under the influence of 
an opiate. Is that not true? So at mice actually show hyperactivation when it comes to, to opiates. Yeah. I think you have to, it's, it's very dose dependent. So, you know, we be a good behavioral pharmacologist and you can see if you got the dose high enough, then I'm sure you would definitely see the, just sit around the and suppression. No, they actually have a very pronounced behavioral effect. You know, they, stand up very straight on their, their feet. They have a very stiff tail called straw tail, and they kind of march around in, in circles in the cage. It's it's very pronounced, yeah. It makes me worry about and that they mouse as a model for opiate well, effects. I think it might just, it might be a dose dependence issue as well. Yeah. So I think you have to take that into consideration. Um, I don't know exactly, I, I, I don't know the... I guess one-to-one -one pharmacology and what we're giving a mouse yeah. and how that relates to what people are actually abusing. Too. And the root of administration is also another like nightmare. I mean, there is no good model. <laughs> it's really the, <laughs> the punchline. But you know, a lot of experiments have done IP, so just a systemic injection, mm -hmm. and that's typically not how you know yeah, drugs sure. are administered. And you know, some of the the gold standard that has been used to date, you know, with cocaine self administration, a lot of other drugs of abuse is intravenous. And yes, drugs can be administered intravenously, but the way that we deal with rodents is very different than I, right. I would say normal uh, drug use. And so whether you're trying to match the pharmacokinetics that you would see in the human population, it's, it's challenging. And so there really is no good model, there's sort of some decent approximations that we could have yeah, that's a good point. So to flip things maybe in the other direction here and something you haven't talked about, it maybe brings Charlie on board here. So, okay, you got increase of dopamine level. We're going overly simplistic here. We got cocaine or something or psychostimulants increases dopamine levels. You get sort of a corresponding increase in enkephalin. What happens in Parkinson's? Is this sort of, in, in, in sort of or in also getting at, is this sort of a conserved mechanism? And I know there's a huge black box in between elevated dopamine levels and increase in caffeine and I, I don't even know if there's anything that we know about in between there right. but if this is sort of a conserved pattern it sort of follows that well in Parkinson's disease where you've got lower dopamine levels do individuals with Parkinson's do they have lower in caffeine levels they actually have higher in levels and it, it comes on board um, well so this was work, I don't know, in, in humans, right? So speaking from rodent work, and this is work from Chip Gerfin's lab and some of the seminal work that, you know, helped us form these hypotheses. Um, if you induce Parkinsonianism in mice by depleting dopamine, what he observed is that after a period of time, you would see this increase of enkephalin expression within the striatum. And this seems to parallel some restoration of motor um, behavior. You know, obviously, they're still Parkinsonian, right? They're still having you know, bradykinesia and all this, but you get some rescue of motor behavior. And so the idea was that this increase of enkephalin, and he did show that this was, um, it was necessary to get, have the dopamine transmission through the D2 receptor. So that was, that, that was the mechanism. So losing that dopamine transmission by, you know, losing the activation of the D2 receptor increased this enkephalin. And so the idea was that it's, it's the striatum trying to regain some sort of balance because this is a huge insult to the striatum. Losing that dopamine transmission, it's going to have you know, all these other neuroadaptations that occur to try to maintain some normal activity of the striatum and output. Um, so it's interesting that it, it, it's very much similar, right? So it's like losing the D2 receptor, losing dopamine, you still get this increase of, of enkephalin. So should we be thinking about these brain uh, adaptations that we have in response to drugs of abuse as not a response to the drugs of abuse, but maybe the brain trying to maintain sort of a homeostatic, you know, level of control in that particular circuit? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really interesting way to, to frame it. I think it's very valid to frame it that way, because the brain always wants some sort of homeostatic control. And you know, when you have individuals that might have pre-existing <clears throat> low levels of D2 receptors, maybe they have a vulnerable, you know, vulnerable circuit because maybe their circuit has, you know, this compensation of enkephalin. And we also know that it enhances, at least in, in mice and rodents, that it enhances the sensitivity of the D1 receptor on the neighboring D1 MSNs. And so now it's like they've jacked up this antenna for their go pathway <laughs> um, to really be sensitive to dopamine. And so when you put a drug on board with that and you really dump dopamine into the system, they're going to be hypersensitive to it. Okay, great. Well, that's a, that sounds like a good place for us to end. That was very fast. <laughs>
I know, it goes by so quick, doesn't it? <laughs> that was a delightful conversation, though. So thank you very much, Lauren. Thank you Alex, so much. And Matt Wanett. And this has been Neuroscientist Talk Shop. Thank you.